from NJ.com. This is Talk is Cheap, a New York Giants podcast. We're talking big blue football all year round. Welcome on in, Giants fans, to the Talk is Cheap podcast right here on NJ.com. As always, I'm Matt Lombardo, joined by my friend and colleague, Daryl Slater. Is it now 3-11 and Giants coming fresh off a win at MetLife Stadium behind Eli Manning last Sunday? Look ahead to a game this week against Washington. Only two games remaining, Daryl, in this lost season that will end without the postseason for the seventh time in eight years. Yeah, and it looks like uh, Daniel Jones comes back this week in Washington. As we speak here Wednesday, he was a full participant in practice, so he looks like he's put the high ankle sprain behind him. He'll be on the field for the final two games, barring another uh, injury or anything like that. So Eli Manning's career potentially over in terms of playing in games. Um, and yeah, so the Giants get to evaluate Daniel Jones for what probably will be his 11th and 12th starts here uh, in Washington and then at home against the Eagles. So they need as much eval time on him as they can get. Yeah, a lot to be gained from getting Daniel Jones back out there. We'll get into all that. We'll talk about what we need to see from Jones over the final two games or even have the chance to see potentially to decide whether it's whether or not it's been a solid and successful rookie year for Jones because obviously the wins and loss record wouldn't add up to that. But certainly if you like what you hear on the podcast, we would love if you would subscribe in the Apple Podcast Store. Leave us a five-star review. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. You can also check us out on SoundCloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and throw us a like on YouTube as well. And we teased it last week, Daryl. We threw it out there. It's now up and running. The Giants extra text service where you can text Daryl and I directly and we've kind of tossed some nuggets your way over the last week. I know I held a little bit of a Q&A during the Thursday night game last week. You've taken a few questions and you've really done a great job of putting little insights and tidbits out there for the subscribers and if people want to jump on board and there's been a lot of enthusiasm so far, just go to nj.com slash text. It's a free trial right now then it's $4.99 a month but I've really enjoyed it Daryl and it's been kind of a breath of fresh air to interact with the fans without having to go through all the clutter and nonsense of dealing with the trolls on Twitter. Yeah, it's been a nice uh, a nice new thing that we're doing here, and uh, I actually just put out a, a text on there asking for questions for the podcast, so uh, obviously this is not a live broadcast, <laughs> so you're not hearing this, but but, uh, but yeah, we got a question from the podcast, so we'll get to the, or we've got a question for the podcast from our tech service, so our Giants Extra service, so we'll get to that uh, later on in the show, and uh, maybe some more will roll in here shortly, so if you're listening, uh, please go ahead and sign up for, for the service if, if you like what you hear, and then you can hit up on there. We'll answer some questions uh, on the podcast that you hit us up through through the tech service. So it's a good way to interact with us. If, if you ever have any questions separate from that too, we'll certainly uh, respond to you on there and offer some insights. And it's 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 been a nice little uh, way to interact with you guys directly. So thanks to everyone who's joined in and then be sure to check it out if you haven't. Yep, nj.com slash text. That's how you get involved. And like that all said, we'll take your questions later on the podcast that we receive through the text message service and, and certainly throughout the upcoming weeks and the offseason as well. Going to be a fascinating offseason, Daryl, and I think that's a good place to start because on Wednesday morning on the site, I basically broke down soup to nuts what I think the Giants need to do going into this offseason. And we've talked about it throughout the course of the year. There needs to be a departure from the quote-unquote giant way, which seems to have been kind of lost in translation over the past decade. Yes, they've won two Super Bowls, but also seven of eight seasons without playoff appearances. I don't know about you, but I think this organization could really benefit from an infusion of uh, a new age, new wave way of thinking, reliance on analytics and data. Uh, a couple GM names that I threw out there in the story, Mike McCarthy is a head coaching candidate is interesting. He talked about this with Peter King this week about building from top to bottom, a analytics and football technology department and building the franchise around that. I think that's really fascinating. How about you? What do you think needs to be the biggest big picture change for this team going into 2020 well, in terms of philosophy? Yeah, I think, you know, if, the Giants are indeed going to do an overhaul, and then we don't know yet if they will. We don't know if Dave Gettleman will follow Pat Shermer out the door. I think that that's something they definitely need to embrace, a more forward-thinking way of doing things in terms of uh, in terms of analytics, embracing analytics, certainly more so than they do right now, which is really not very much at all under Dave Gettleman. So uh, whenever the Giants do make a GM change and a regime change in that regard, they, that's something they need to look for. And, and whether it's after this year or after next year, I think this team needs to start moving into the future a little bit more more than it is right now. They're kind of stuck in ways that have worked and, and worked big in big 
successful ways in the past, um, but that may not be the, the way that the NFL is going to go in the future. And I think in terms of the coach search, one interesting point, I got a chance to talk to Trent Dilfer yesterday, and one interesting point he brought up is he really thinks uh, the best teams right now in the NFL and the teams that are looking for head coaches should should do this. The, the best teams in the NFL offense-wise do do this, and the, and the, uh, and the teams that are looking for coaches uh, like the Giants should do this, especially if you have a quarterback you need to develop, and that is look for a coach who has studied the college game extensively in terms of spread offense stuff, misdirection stuff. Yeah. Similar to what Andy Reid's done in Kansas City, you need to have a coach in your staff with a lot of influence, whether it's a head coach or the OC or someone like that, uh, who has spent a lot of time studying the college game, and that's where the, the NFL is trending, is one thing Trent Dilfer pointed out. So I thought that was an interesting uh, an interesting perspective on what the Giants ought to be looking for, not necessarily in their next head coach, but from the mindset of that next head coach in terms of the guys he brings in. And that kind of lends you back into the conversation about Matt Rule, the head coach at Baylor. And he went on Adam Schefter's podcast and gave an extensive interview about what it would take for him to go from Baylor to the NFL. Not the Giants specifically, but just make the jump from college to the pros. He had the Bears knocking on the doorstep of the college football playoff this year and sounded very content with his situation in Baylor and wanting to continue to build there and hopefully in his perspective, you know, knock down that door to get into the playoff. What I found really fascinating, Daryl, was he made the comment that the head coaches that are successful, be it in college or in the pros, whether it's Bill Belichick or Nick Saban, they drive the bus. They build the entire program from top to bottom. It's their philosophy. And the programs, head coaches, and teams that fail are the ones who hire their head coaches based around their X's and O's and their play calling abilities and just what they do on Sundays. And I thought that's very interesting because if you think back to why the Giants hired Pat Shermer, a lot of it had to do with his success with the Minnesota Vikings as a play caller, what he got out of quarterback Case Keenum, turning him into a borderline MVP candidate back in 2017, really X's and O's minded. And yes, you can talk about the component of needing an adult in the room with all of the turmoil at the back end of the Ben McAdoo era. But I think that when you talk about the Dabo Swinney's and the Nick Sabans and the Bill Belichick's and what Matt Rule's referring to is, it's the head coach and the football team taking on the personality and embodiment of that head coach. We haven't seen that with Pat Shermer, or maybe we have, and it just hasn't been the type of identity that's going to be successful in the NFL. But if the Giants are interested in rule or a similar coach, I think that's something they need to consider. They're not going to give the keys to the franchise to Matt Rule. I mean, so if Matt Rule thinks that that's what he wants with coming to the Giants, like, might as well just stay at Baylor, where he's got a pretty good situation. And it's a very good situation. He's got a lucrative contract. Uh, he's got a lot more job security than he would have come into the Giants, I would I would have presumed. So, um that's not happening for for him in the NFL. It's like, dude, that. So if you want to if you want to do that, just stay in college. No one's right. going to give you the keys to the franchise as a guy who's never been an NFL head coach. Pete Carroll earned that right. Sean Payton earned that right. Uh, you know, they, they work hand in hand with their GMs. There is a GM there still. Bill Belichick's the only coach who doubles as a GM in the NFL. So. I don't necessarily know if what he's saying is entirely true. Does Kyle Shanahan have total power in San Francisco? No, I don't think so. I mean, he's an X's and O's guy who's done some pretty good things there. Um, and yeah, I mean, look, Andy Reid, he has a lot of say in Kansas City, but he's also a pretty darn good X's and O's guy. He right. calls the plays. So I get what he's saying. What he's saying is the coaches who – it's chicken and eggs type stuff, though. It's like the coaches who are great in the NFL and succeed and win uh, have – total control or a lot of say, a lot of control. Well, they also have a lot of say or a lot of control because they've been successful. Because they had success. It's, right, so, it's earned at the NFL level, whereas in college, right. you're hired to be that CEO right, type. No and GM. that's what makes Saban successful. And, right. It's and, every college correct. head coach. So there is no GM in college. So I get what he's saying. And a college coach who wants to have total control. I mean, he, he, that interview that he had with the Jets last year where they made you know staffing suggestions um, – Look, I mean, that's the reality for a college coach who wants to make a jump to the NFL at the inexperienced level that Matt Rule is at. It's not like he's been a college coach for 20, 30 years. It's like, okay, so if you want that total control, stay in college. Right. And you got a pretty good job there. Um, so I, I would, I think the, I think he'd do a nice job with the Giants. But are they going to give them the keys to the fran- give them the keys to the franchise, or should they? No, they they aren't, and no, they shouldn't. And whether it's Rule or whether it's anyone else they bring in, I think that what the Giants need to focus on, and the, this needs to be laser like, is 
what has this head coach done with rookie quarterbacks in their past or young quarterbacks in their coaching past? Because, again, any head coach they hire is going to be told Daniel Jones is your quarterback. Any head coach they hire is going to be tasked with developing Daniel Jones. And what's most important for the Giants in the short term is getting him to take a big step forward in the vein of a Carson Wentz or a Jared Goff or a Lamar Jackson or any of these young quarterbacks who have made that big leap from year one to year two, Josh Allen to a certain extent as well. So you need to find a quarterback who has experience developing quarterbacks, in my opinion. If they don't have that experience, they don't get an interview. Yeah, for sure. And the, and even if you're talking about Ron Rivera, who has not necessarily hands-on experience because he's a defense, kind of a defensive-focused coach, uh, and, and he would be more of a CEO-type head coach, he, he does have experience with Cam Newton uh, in terms of his his growth in Carolina. And I think also, if you have a CEO-type coach, and that's one thing Trent Dilfer brought up yesterday when I talked to him, that he, he you know he's fine with uh, a CEO-type coach, a guy who has maybe a defensive background or special teams background, uh, as long as that guy can bring in a, a coordinator or a quarterback uh, worker, whisperer, what I hate that term, but someone who works with a quarterback to uh, to develop the guy. And that that's what matters. It has to be priority number one for the Giants this offseason. And what's fascinating or at least interesting is that whatever happens to Pat Shermer, if he's not the Giants head coach next season, there's a good chance he lands as an offensive coordinator somewhere because he's done some pretty nice things with quarterbacks in his past. And I think that when we look at Shermer, he's made some really interesting play calls. I think he's had a couple of games where, especially the flea flicker that didn't work, it was it was a, a really smart, you know, interesting play call at that time. It just got blown up because Nate Solder got blown up on the play. But I think there's going to be a marker, market for Shermer as an offensive coordinator in the NFL and maybe even within the NFC East next season. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the Cowboys could have a regime change down there. I mean, obviously, Washington is going to have a, a new coach. So where where could Shermer land? I mean, there's certainly two options there for him to, uh, to have landing spots. He could always just take a year off and collect his money. He's got three years left on his contract after this year. So the Giants will, will be paying him out. Uh, and they'll be, you know, if he goes elsewhere, they're going to pay the difference of what he makes versus what he was going to make. So, uh, yeah, I think that that's certainly possible that he could go and be an NFL offensive coordinator next year if he, if he wants to go that route. Um, and I think that's ultimately his ceiling in the NFL, and that's okay. He's not head coaching material, but he's done some good things as a coordinator and, and maybe could be, like you said, back in the NFC East in Dallas or Washington. Yeah, or even in Philadelphia where if the Eagles don't, don't make the playoffs or it's one and done, I think there's going to be some real pressure for – uh, Doug Peterson to make some personnel changes as well on the coaching staff. So they have experience working together in the past, and there's a chance that he winds up, Shermer does, as the Eagles offensive coordinator, which he was under Chip Kelly from, I believe, 2014 to 2016 before Kelly was fired. So something to watch there for Shermer. I think we're still in agreement here that Shermer is probably gone after this season. Daryl, I don't know that there's a whole lot that he can do um, this season to save his job. Yeah, that's one that goes perfectly with the question we got uh, on our uh, Giants Extra Tech service. And, and like I said, you know, it's a great place to ask us questions for the podcast, interact with us, and be sure to check it out. Uh, this one is from – the person didn't sign their name, and I'm certainly not going to read their phone number. <laughs> Maybe we should ask people to start signing their names on here. But if you, if you sent the question you're listening, you know, you know who it is. But it's it's a question maybe a lot of people have on their minds. And do you, he says uh, – he or she, whoever this is, says, do you think uh, if the Giants went out, Pat Shermer can save his job? And I – no way. I think – it's, his fate was sealed with that collapse of a loss in Philadelphia, and that did it. And at this point, the best they can do is five and eleven, which is which is what his record was last year, and that's not going to be enough. So I think that if they went six and ten by closing the season by winning four straight games, sure. I mean, maybe that that would have been possible at that point. But the collapse in Philadelphia really sealed the deal. Um, I, I don't see any way he saves his job. I'm in about 98% agreement with you that there's no way he saves his job. But I keep going back to that Dave Gettleman quote before the season back in training camp where he said, if he walks off the field at MetLife Stadium in week 17 and feels like the Giants are headed in the right direction. John Merrick. John Merrick, excuse yeah. me, that, that they would not make a change. That that's, you know, that that's the goal. It will be a successful season if they walk off the field in week 17 um, against the Eagles feeling like they're headed in the right direction. And, and I can't fight this little devil on my shoulder down. Darryl, that's saying there's now a chance that let's say Jones goes out and lights it up in Washington, throws for 325 yards, two touchdowns. Saquon Barkley rushes for a buck ten and a score. They blow out Washington. Uh, the Eagles beat the Cowboys on Sunday. They win the division. It's all locked up. They rest their starters, and Jones has a big day against the Eagles, and they finish winning three in a row, two with Daniel Jones, and Jones has back-to-back -back solid performances. 
part of me thinks, and I don't agree with this, I'm in agreement with you that the way this should play out is that Shermer's fate is sealed and you have to evaluate the entire body of work. But if they win these next two games, win convincingly, Jones looks good, DeAndre Baker, Julian Love, and Dexter Lawrence have big games on defense, and you start to see maybe what the Giants hope the offense will be at the beginning of the year. I think there's a chance the Giants might talk themselves into continuity for the sake of Jones's development is most important, and I wouldn't rule out him being back next year. Maybe a small chance, yeah. I About think two percent, right? Yeah, <laughs> sure. I think, but it, it's going to take a lot of a lot of doing uh, down the stretch, especially from Daniel Jones' perspective uh, in terms of having success. I think one thing with the Jets, they kept Adam Gase and. Uh, and I hate to keep getting back to Trent over thing, but I thought he brought up a lot of interesting points. And one of them was that, you know, if, if the Jets had fired Gase, you would have been talking about a quarterback in Darnold who had been in a fourth different offense in four years. His final year at USC, then Todd Bowles, then Adam Gase, then the next coach. That would have been four different head coaches and four different, really, offensive approaches, uh, presuming the next coach, whoever the Jets would have fired for next year, wouldn't have done something just like, uh, you know, the, the Gase or Todd Bowles' system had. So I think that continuity is important, but remember, I mean, we've said this over and over and over again since the beginning of the year when we were talking about will the will a team with a rookie quarterback fire a head coach. It happens all the time. Yeah. It happens all the time. It happened with uh, Hugh Jackson in, in Cleveland, obviously. That was, you know, he was a complete disaster for a while, but it happened with Todd Bowles. It, it you know, it, it happens where a coach, you know, Jeff Fisher, uh, again, these are guys who aren't good head coaches, but neither is Pat Shermer. It's like... So it's documented. His winning percentage is something, what, 267, something yeah. in that area right so now? So you're not talking about a first-year head coach and a rookie quarterback. You're talking about a guy who's had a year uh, and had two now to, to show what he can do, and it hasn't been enough. So almost certainly gone, but yeah, I could see maybe 2%. I think he would have been fired if they lost that game against the Dolphins. Um, but instead, they uh, they beat the Dolphins. They get a, uh, you know, a nice send-off for Eli Manning, which will you know, that might be the final time he plays in an NFL game, period, let alone with the Giants, let alone at MetLife Stadium. Like, that is probably it, potentially it for him. So I thought that was a you know, nice moment, obviously, for him. And Daniel Jones, Daniel Jones back to fully healthy, back yeah. on the field with the first-team offense today, back to being a full participant. Just like that, Eli Manning plays one game in front of the home crowd. The 700 people left in the stands late in the fourth quarter yeah. get to give him a send-off. And I'm being partially facetious here because it was a great moment for Eli Manning and his family. And, you know, I was critical leading up to and still believe that if Jones was fully healthy, he should have played played last week. Um, but after you saw the day unfold, I don't think it could have gone any better for the Giants or for Eli Manning. And seeing him hug his daughters after the game and hug his family and having that send off uh, with the fans, good for Eli, good for the Giants. But not now, it, let's get back to the business of developing Daniel Jones. And it looks like we're going to have the chance to see that the next two weeks. Yeah. And I, I, I you know, it was a cool moment. I, I don't think they played him just for sentiment, sentimentality's sake. I think Daniel Jones obviously was actually hurt. And, uh, yeah, and it was it was a neat way for Eli Manning to kind of wrap up his career. And um, the thing that now you look ahead, and if, as a side note, it's like if you're going to that game and you know it's Eli Manning's final game, why do you leave early? What are you doing? Like, <laughs> that's insane. I don't understand that. You spent money on a ticket to go to Eli Manning's final game to give him a send-off. Right? You're not there because you want to see the Dolphins, I presume, unless you're, a, unless you're a Dolphins fan. So I don't understand why so many people – leave these games early. Like, you spend money on a ticket. What do you have to get home for? Like, right. And it was a 1 o'clock game. It's not like it was an 8 o'clock Sunday night game and you're thinking, man, I, I got to get up and go to work. It was so weak. Even a 4 so o'clock yeah. game where maybe it's, you know, 7.30 at night and it's going to take two hours to get home and you got to get up for it. It was 4 o'clock in the afternoon the game was over. I, I, it was so weak that there were so few fans there. That was terrible, honestly. Like, I, it's just the weakest thing ever. But the people who were there gave Eli Manning a nice send-off. Um, and uh, the thing now looking forward here is, you know, the Giants won, obviously which some of the people were happy about. Some folks, maybe not. So I'm writing a little something for the morning about that. Should you root for the Giants to lose out for draft position? And, uh, you know, I could see certainly why fans would say, yeah, if they you know, want to get a higher draft pick, Chase Young, that whole thing. But look, I mean, <laughs> the problem with rooting for the team to lose out is you're rooting for the young players that you're rebuilding with to perform poorly. 
Like, there's not a lot of dead weight left in terms of the guys they're playing. Janoris Jenkins is gone. Uh, you know, some of these other Sam guys... Sam Beal and DeAndre Baker are going to be your corners for the foreseeable future, or at least next season. Right. Do you want to see what you have in Julian Love? And uh, Daniel Jones is starting. So the Giants are losing and playing terribly. That means in the 11th and 12th starts of Daniel Jones's career, he's probably playing terribly. And that's a bad sign. So why do you want that just for the possibility of getting Chase Young in the draft when you don't even know if Chase Young is going to be really good? The draft is a total crapshoot. Go back and look at some of these drafts in, in years like 2015 when Leonard Williams was picked. Look at some of the players that were picked in the top 10. I think Todd Gurley went like 10th or 11th or 12th or something. And Kevin White was like number 7. The guy was a total bust. Leonard Williams is you know, obviously not lived up to his draft status. So the draft is a total crapshoot. Just because you're picking at 8 or 6 or 4 or two. Instead of, instead of two. Whatever, yeah. In, instead of two. if you, You've had the, number two picks go belly up in the past, too. I mean, it, 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 to your point, it's a total crapshoot. Number one overall picks have gone belly up in the past. Right. So I just, the notion of, 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 of rooting for this team, especially now that Daniel Jones is back, the notion of rooting for this team to lose doesn't make a lot of sense because the, the whole premise of why you're, you're supposedly rooting for them to lose is, is flawed. You know, so I think that that really, I just gave away everything I'm going to write for the morning. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> it's the, the audio companion to your story, so yeah, to speak. And so this will publish, I guess, Thursday morning anyway. Yeah. So the story will be out at the same time. Exactly. And and as far as Jones goes, I think there's a lot to be learned over these next two games. It's your second time around facing him uh, from a Redskin perspective. They, that was the last win was in, um, I believe it was week four. Well, before the Miami game. Yep. Well, correct. Jones's with Jones' last, last win. September 29th. Yeah, yeah exactly. It was down in ten- Well, they beat the Redskins here with... Jones. So that would have been um, yeah, September 29th. Yep. So you look at this game, it's his second time against the defense. It's his second time um, against an opponent. It's a road division game. His first one of those that he's starting. So you look at everything to be gained this week, it's the same you know, laundry list of items you want to see improved. Pre-snap recognition and getting the offensive line into the right run set against what the defense is showing them. Uh, protecting the football, not turning the ball over with fumbles in the pocket or interceptions continuing to develop uh, you know, a strong rapport and chemistry with Darius Slayton and with Barkley out there and with Golden Tate and with Sterling Shepard. These things all matter, and that's why these snaps against the Redskins on Sunday and then the Eagles in Week 17, it's important. And I think that if you're watching the game, sure, I think that fans would probably sign up for a 37-35 to 35 loss where Jones passes for 350 yards, but if they win the game, th- there's some benefit in that too because it can build confidence for Jones going into the offseason. And this is a young team that has to figure out how to win. Let's Figuring not lose sight of that. how to win. Yep, Darius Slayton was great on that. I talked to him today in the locker room. You know, we were recording this on Wednesday, obviously, and I think it's going to publish on Thursday. But today being Wednesday when I was talking to Darius Slayton in the locker room, you know, first day that these guys are back here after the big win, the big win, I guess for them, after the win over Miami on Monday or on Sunday. Uh, and one thing that Slayton brought up, and he's a fifth-round pick who's had a really good year, is, you know, just – you can get a good player anywhere in the draft, and he knows that better than anybody. And he was talking about that very thing, learning to win. The team is young and needs to learn how to win, and that losses is obviously are not going to contribute to that. So um, there you go. I think that you know there, there's certainly the possibility that uh, you know the other thing is what if the Eagles? Uh, so the Eagles Cowboys game Sunday that decides the NFC East. Yes, obviously, right. Yep. So so either the Eagles the Eagles in Week 17 are going to have nothing to play for one way or the other. Correct. So there you go. So. That that's some you know a potential feather in the cap for Jones in terms of being able to beat a team that um, if they're if they have nothing to play for and it's a negative I presume they're not going to rest their starters it wouldn't make a lot of sense right so they'll only rest guys if um, if they're going to the playoffs but if they are not going to the playoffs and they play their starters look there's there's a, a Jones playing against obviously not a super motivated Eagles team but one that has got their starters out there that's a potential feather in the cap for him right there so uh, i think he'll take no matter take success no matter how it comes he's not going to apologize for beating a team's backups if in fact that's what the Eagles do in week 17 so um yeah, I think these are these are two big opportunities. The guy's only started ten games, right? So you're talking about two more games. That's a fifth of what he started already. So it's it, it's ex, you know it's an, it, exponentially wouldn't be the right word, but it's it's two starts. Yes, only two starts, but two starts is not an only thing when you've started only ten games. So I think that you know this is really important that he was able to get back here. I think Giants fans should be really thrilled, even though the season is meaningless at this point. It really isn't, but they should be thrilled that. Uh, that he's able to get back and play these final two games because this is this is 
this should be, you should want to watch these games if you're a Giant fan. And I can understand not wanting to watch these last two with Eli Manning playing. Right. But these are games you want to watch because this is a guy that may or may not be your guy going forward. You're in the determining stages of that. Yeah, and, and we're going to find out for part. sure probably next yeah. year in terms of the leap that he makes this offseason and how much better he is mm-hmm. or if he mm-hmm. stays the same or if the same issues continue to be problems. Then you start thinking about, oh, man, what if he's not the quarterback and you have to go and draft one in 2021 or 2022? Um, but it's important in the NFL, especially as a rookie quarterback, to get as many snaps as you can. And I'm not a big believer at all in the fact that he could have learned anything, um, you know, last week by watching Eli Manning. You did that for the first two games before becoming the starter. Just like I'm not a believer that if he wasn't going to play the rest of the way, that there would be anything to be gained from that. You learn as a rookie quarterback by playing. And as you said, Daryl, the Giants should be thrilled that he's back out there. Yeah, no doubt. I think it makes it adds some intrigue to these final two games. And I think... Uh, you know, there's a lot to be gained for Daniel Jones, and we'll see if he's able to seize the opportunity. And there's going to be a really interesting subplot to this because, of course, there was a lot of talk leading up to the draft that the Giants might have been all in on Dwayne Haskins. And, and I remember writing a story about Dave Gettleman saying that the one trait that a young rookie quarterback prospect that he would be evaluating needs to have is having the ability to overcome adversity. And I took that to, you know, point out a big comeback win at Penn State that launched Ohio State season or a couple of comeback wins late in the, the season last year for Dwayne Haskins, that that was the adversity he overcame, as we come to know now, that he was probably referring to Jones' ability to play through injuries and, you know, receivers not catching the football, and he kind of telegraphed the fact that they were taking Jones, if you read between the lines there. But the subplot here is, there was a lot of thought that it could have been Dwayne Haskins as the pick for the Giants at number 6 or at number 17. And these two obviously are facing off for the second time, but Haskins came on in relief back in September. He'll be the starter. He's played really well the last couple of weeks. So just from you know a pride standpoint, I think that there's a lot to be gained for Daniel Jones if he goes out there and plays at a high level against Haskins and outperforms him on Sunday. For sure. And the first time that Haskins played, that was his first time on the, playing in an NFL regular season game was here at MetLife Stadium. And he was a disaster. He did not look ready. And, and I, Jay Gruden, his head coach, didn't think he was ready, and he wound up getting fired the next week. Yeah, he was not ready at that point. And the Giants just ate him alive. And now they're going to get to see a little bit of a different Dwayne Haskins, not a guy who's a seasoned veteran, but a guy who's had some success. And I think this will be a fun uh, matchup in terms of uh, you know two high-profile quarterbacks in this draft, even though both of these teams are basically jockeying for draft position um, right now, even though we kind of punched holes on that whole argument. But that uh, I think this that'll be, a, a, like you said, a really nice proof proving point for Daniel Jones to say, hey, look, I went out here and outperformed uh, this I heard guy. all the talk leading up to the draft. I heard all yeah. the boos after the draft when they took me six sure. over you Dwayne know that's Haskins. Motivating him. You know, uh, here, here's what I can do. Got to be motivating. No doubt. It's only human nature. All right, Daryl, let's look ahead to the game on Sunday a little bit. How do you see it playing out? Again, I forgot what I picked when I said it today. <laughs> this time, I'm actually going to go into my email and look at what I actually picked. All right, for while this you game. look yours up, I haven't sent it to you yet, but this is what it's going to be. I think that the Giants go down. Um, they blew out the Redskins last year. They beat them pretty handily in week three, week four, rather this year. I think they get the sweep this year, and I think they hurt themselves in the Chase Young sweepstakes. And we're going to have a lot of angry Giants fans <laughs> over Christmas week because Chase Young will not be a stocking stuffer. Uh, I think the Giants go down. They take care of business. They get it done. Something in the area of 27 to 17. Oh, wow. So you maybe you, you subliminally remembered what my pick was. It was 20, I'm reading it right now. I sent it to our uh, to the rest of our guys when we do our picks. 24 to 17, Giants win. I think they, they can handle Haskins. I think the defense uh, puts together another pretty solid game, and I think that this defense, this Giants defense, is getting confidence, and Daniel Jones, um, you know, does enough to win. 24-17 is what I'm looking at. Yep, sounds about right. Daryl, um, since we won't be talking to these guys again, just want to say Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to everybody. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to you and your family. Um, enjoyed working with you over the second half of the season. Look forward to what what's to come the rest of the season and into the off season. Yeah, Happy Holidays to everybody out there. Thank you for, for listening, and thanks to the folks who uh, participate in our Giants Extra Text uh, service. Be sure to check that out, and uh, maybe give it as a holiday gift to someone. How about that? Yeah, there there it is. Idea, right? yeah. The stocking stuffer could be the con- <laughs> Information email that you get printed yeah, out, printed. To put it in the stocking. Here's your Giants extra tech service. There we go. That's a that's a great gift. So I appreciate everyone's feedback and everything like that. Thank you for reading. Thank you for listening. Happy holidays. Happy New Year to everybody. We'll be back here next week at some point. We usually record on Wednesdays, but Wednesday's Christmas, so uh, maybe knock it out the. Uh, We'll the day after out. Christmas yeah. and then uh, have it ready to go the next day. So, uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. And uh, this should be an interesting game on Sunday in 
Maybe the worst stadium in the NFL. The worst. The worst. The worst. I, I agree. It, definitively yeah. the worst. An <laughs> absolute pit. That that might be the <laughs> discussion of the podcast next week because whatever happens in this game, as long as Dave Gettleman and Pat Shermer aren't fired, is probably going to be pretty inconsequential. So I think next week we should spend the podcast <laughs> breaking down the travails of our trip to, from, and during FedEx Field. Yeah. So I'm just hoping to get out of there as quickly as possible after the game and get catch the train home. So safe travels to anyone going to the game. And uh, looks like it'll be a decent weather weekend in the D.C. area. So enjoy that uh, and enjoy seeing Daniel Jones back out there. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. He's Daryl Slater. Follow him on Twitter at Daryl Slater. I'm Matt Lombardo at Matt Lombardo NFL on Twitter. You can also follow the show at Talk is Cheap NYG. And please, uh, if you're interested, sign up for the tech service Giants Extra. It's nj.com slash text. For Daryl Slater, I'm Matt Lombardo. Enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the game. And we'll talk to you next week right here on the Talk is Cheap podcast. Podcast.